Let me tell you the story. You're doing me a massive favour if you leave me a comment. Tell me which bits resonated. Right, so let's start from the beginning. Broke kid. Uh, council estate kid in the UK. If you're from America or somewhere else, you don't know what council estate kid is. I guess it's like the projects in the US. But uh, unemployed parents for the vast majority of my childhood. Um, I think maybe my, da my dad became a taxi driver when I was 13 or something like that. So all of my single digits... I had unemployed parents, which means we were brought up on the state, state benefits. So that's just enough to uh, live. It's a roof over your head, uh, albeit in a rough area. Um, and you don't get the benefits of your own bedroom and stuff. Like we had a two bedroom house, even though uh, there was like four of us. So it's like, I ended up having a bedroom in the dining room just so I could have my own space. And my brother had the bedroom upstairs. Anyway. Council estate kid had nothing. People around me, I wouldn't say that the estate I grew up on was super drug filled. It wasn't, there was drugs there, but it wasn't crazy. There was violence there. Yes, there was stabbings, there was murders. I remember, I can go, yeah, that street had a murder on it. It was that lady that got dumped in the thing. That street got murdered. That was a cheeky young lad that got stabbed. Like that, that, like all the streets around me have got like little stories of murder and stabbings. But it wasn't that bad. I make it sound like it was like in a city like Rio de Janeiro in like the... No, it wasn't that bad. People weren't getting shot every day. But there was occasional kind of murders and stuff, which you don't get here. I don't know, since we've lived here five, six years, whatever it is, there been no murders that I'm aware of. Um, definitely not in this village, even if there's been stuff around it. Um no, but no, no, no murders here. And where I lived last, I lived there 10 years. No murders there, no murders. So, so growing up and knowing murder there, murder there, murder there, I'm trying to paint a picture of it. It wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best. Uh, I often had to run away from lads four or five years older than me, gang, would be chasing me in gangs to try and kick the shit out of me. Um, and, I, and that was my normal life as a single digit kid that was allowed out on the streets. I was. A, I call myself a street kid, but that sounds like I was homeless. I wasn't homeless. I was allowed out on the streets. Um, and I used to love going out on the streets with my mates. I was out every day. I loved it. I loved my upbringing. My mum and dad gave me loads of love. Uh, they just had no money. Um, and everyone around me was a little bit like, the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. I know your place, Matt. I was told that. I was told that by close people to me. The rich stay poor. Uh, it's the rich stay rich. The poor stay poor. Um, and I didn't believe that, but anyway, my mom said that I wanted to get money right from being really young. She says, I looked at a book um, and on, on, when, she, when she asked me, and I don't know how old I would have been, five, I don't know. But she asked me when I was very, very young what I wanted to do for a living. And like it was a job. And I pointed to uh, this front cover of this book and said, I want to I wanna do that. And it was a it was a bank or a bank vault or something. There was a load of money on this on this book, um, and she thought I wanted to be a bank manager. And actually, when she like spoke to me more, she realised no, I wanted all the money in the, in there. And I think that's <coughs> that was seeded into me from a very young age by always hearing no, you, no, 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 no. Can we go here? No, we can't afford it. Oh no. Uh, can I have this? No. Can I have a chocolate bar? No. Can I have a McDonald's? No. I, didn't, I don't remember having a McDonald's as a kid, even though they live on them these days. Um, can we do this? Can we do that? Can I have that? Can, can I have this toy? Can I have that? No, 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 no. Can't afford it. So I don't know if it's nature nurture. I don't know if I was born wanting more or if it was my circumstances. I imagine it's probably a bit of both, but probably more the circumstances and the upbringing. Hearing no all the time and, and going to school, this was first school, so I was only a kid, little kid. Um, I remember getting, I, I call it teased. Some people call it bullied, but I remember getting shit off of the kids for um, never having been abroad. Um, bear in mind, these weren't rich kids. These were poor kids. Most of them lived on the same council estate, but, but like there was different levels of poor, I guess. And the fact that we'd never been on abroad, we only ever, ever went on holiday in like tents on a campsite or whatever. Um, which we borrowed from my first school teacher, bless her, Mrs. Storer, what a legend. But she lent us the tent to go on a, a camping holiday in the UK. And I used to get shit for stuff like that. 
Um, so, um, and my clothes were like hand-me-downs or like four sizes too big, so I'd grow into them or whatever. Like the first day of upper school, uh, my blazer was that long, it touched my knees, below my knees, and, and it was like that. I think my mum took the sleeves up so they didn't look ridiculous. But she got me that so it would last me the whole of the school, and it did. I started off with it like too big, and by the time I'd finished school, it was just the right size, it, albeit a bit beat up. Uh, I remember I shared my uh, advent calendar, you know the advent calendar with chocolates in at Christmas. I shared my advent calendar with my brother, my older brother, and he used to trick me. Uh, so he'd always get like the 24, the, the, the big chocolate, because it was usually like a big chocolate for Christmas Eve. He, he would, because I was too young and too stupid to figure it out, he would trick me into, and, and um, kind of uh, get me to have, like he'd be like, oh, you start, I can't remember, I don't even know now which one it would be on, but like, you have the first one, Matt, assuming that gives him 24. He would do it every time. But I'd have day by day, just one little bit of chocolate because we couldn't afford to have two calendars. I remember one year we, I shared my main Christmas present, uh, which was, I think, the main thing we got that year. Uh, if not the only thing. We always used to get like a bag of uh, those chocolate uh, gold coin things with the foil. We used to get things like that. And I remember I got a little selection box every year. But we had a board game one year and it was, uh, I shared it with my brother. Um, and he chose it. He tricked me again. He was like, oh, you really like this board game? And then we got this board game and that was that was essentially our present. It was what he wanted and he tricked me into it. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, some years, my mum and dad really, really, really uh, sacrificed and saved up so they could get us something special. But these are just some of my memories. I'm not trying to make out they were bad parents. They were great parents, amazing parents. I couldn't have asked for better parents in such a difficult situation. But I had a poor upbringing. Again, if any of this stuff resonates with you, please write it down or leave it in a comment down below. It really matters to me because when I tell these stories, I'm not going to tell them the entire story like I'm telling you now. I'm, and this is not going to be the full story. This is just bits and bobs. Anyway, I'm going to pick bits out, which is why I would really like to know from you which bits resonate with you because I'm just telling my story. But to you, some of it will make you go, oh, wow, I didn't realise that. Oh, wow, that impacts me emotionally. That's the stuff that matters so I can tell my story in the future as I move back into this info product space in a bigger way. So here I am, a, a single digit kid, running street on the streets, bloody getting into semi-regular fights or scuffles or trouble, Not, never because I started it. Um, I started martial arts really young. Black belt now, not that I'm trying to brag or anything like that. I can't get my bloody foot above my waist anymore. So it's not like you're getting kicked in the head by me. But um, I started uh, martial arts very, very young. And I was taught by my instructors at the time, like, never start a fight. Just be willing to finish one if you have to. Just be willing to fight. And I've, I've lived by that kind of mantra my entire life. Um, and I've been in a lot of fights. But proudly, I guess it's proudly, I've never started them. I've never been the aggressor, never been the bully, never been the one that's actually thrown the first punch. But I've been in tons of fights, never through my choice. Not because I'm like, come on then, and then they've hit me. Like, don't get me wrong, like, just the other day, some idiot was going to, like, it was shouting at us for, like, him almost riding into us on his bike. So I gave him a bit of lip back, and that could have turned into a scuffle. I'm not perfect. I'm not trying to say like I'm some kind of holier than holy. No, I've I've been naughty boy in the past. Um, you know, not terrible. There's all levels, but I've, I've been a naughty boy in my countless estate days. I did some naughty things, but I wasn't a bully. I wasn't, it, it, to a certain extent, it was bully or be bullied. So you you can't be soft. But but like, I wasn't somebody that physically went out and started fights. But I've been plenty of them. Anyway, I'm going around in circles. So we really... If you're listening and if you're interested and if you are going to let me know which bits of this story resonate with you, I do really appreciate it because I realise you're giving me a lot of your time and uh, most people won't give a shit about any of what I'm telling you now. Uh, but hopefully there'll be some value somewhere in it somewhere and if not, at least you'll have done me a solid favour by writing some comments and telling me which bits resonate with you. So anyway, you, you get a picture of where I grew up. It was a little bit violent. It was a little bit... It wasn't super drugs, but there was there. Uh, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't good. We didn't have any money. 
I got this fire in my belly, nature nurture, I don't know whether it was born there and, or whatever, or if it was my upbringing, but I got this fire in my belly to get rich because I wanted to change the lives of my family and me and my future family, like kids, grandkids, whatever. I didn't want to be in the same situation that I was in growing up. Uh, I didn't want my kids or my kids' kids to not be able to go abroad on holiday. I didn't want um, I didn't want them to have to wear clothes that were too big or too small because we got, couldn't afford it. I didn't want them to eat unhealthy sh because we can't afford healthy stuff. I didn't want them to live that same kind of uh, carrots estate, working class lifestyle that I did. So I decided very young I would get rich no matter what it took. And that meant what, no matter what it took, I didn't care. Um, now I've matured and grown up, I'm a little bit more like, well, I wouldn't do that because that's illegal and that's like crazy. But, but like at the time, like whatever it took, that was my attitude. I was gonna get rich, whatever it took. So I told my first girlfriend, I won't say her name. I was gonna say her name then, I won't say her name. Bless her, she's a good, she was a, on the whole, a decent girlfriend. But I told her that I was gonna be a millionaire someday. I don't know what age I'd have been. I don't know, maybe 17 or something like that when I told her this. Maybe 16. No, no, no. No, she weren't my girlfriend then. So maybe I was 17, 18. I don't know. But I told her I was going to be a millionaire someday. And she said, look at you, man. You're nothing. You're a nobody. You'll never make anything of your life. That, that sounds terrible that she would say that. That sounds like she was a bad person. She wasn't. She was a really good person. And I have nothing but good thoughts towards her. I'm thankful to her for that part of my story. But yeah, she said, she said, look at you, Matt, you're nothing, you're nobody. <clears throat> you never make anything of your life. But she wasn't isolated in the way she thought that. I was a bit of a, I wasn't feral, but I was a bit of a nightmare. Um, I wasn't one of the bad kids, but if I was, if I was a kid around this area where I live now, oh, I'd have been Satan's spawn, honestly. I'd have been terrible. But again, it's all levels. There were some kids that were really bad. And then there were some kids that were pretty good. And I was somewhere in the middle, a bit naughty, a bit cheeky, a bit arrogant, a bit just a little bit of a, yeah, naughty, naughty. And didn't even realise I'm naughty until I'm older and look back. But anyway, <coughs> I got um, later on in life, I, I, uh, I got a job. No, in fact, I'm skipping ahead. Don't skip ahead, Matt. So yeah, anyway, I'm told I'll never make anything in my life. My teachers at the time were like, uh, I'm more likely to end up in prison or, um, yeah, I'm more likely to end up in prison or rich. I remember one saying that to me. And it's like, no one believed in me. Like I say, rich stay rich, poor stay poor. That was their attitude. Know your place, Matt. Um, and, and that was just it. I didn't know anyone, anybody around me that was... Um, running businesses or anything. I, there was only one person that I knew that kind of had a business and that was my uncle. I didn't see him that often. I never talked about business, but he like owned like a steel fabrication, one man band with it, like him and maybe an assistant or something like that, making gates. Uh, and I think he had a burger van at one point or something like that. But other than him, I didn't really know anyone in business. So, so like I didn't, it's not like I was, I've got Elon Musk style connections. It was just me trying to figure out stuff on my own. Anyway, so I did school, did well in my GCSEs, uh, pretty good. One A, six Bs, two Cs and an F. If you ask me what the F's in, it was in French. It was terrible. I was sat in the oral exam. You had to do an oral exam with a teacher and I was rolling with tears, laughter. Not crying, laughter. I was just laughing. This was recorded and I, I believe submitted to an exam board, so it's probably somewhere. And I, I'm laughing, and I couldn't stop laughing. And then at, at one point, he started laughing because I was laughing, and my entire oral exam in French was us two just rolling with laughter. Um, I don't think he laughs, lasted there. I think that was his last year at that school. He was a PE teacher, and uh, he was my form tutor, and he was because he'd lived in France for five minutes, they made him a French teacher. Um, and yeah, anyway, I didn't do so well in French. I failed it and it was just like this oral exam was laughter. It was just bad. But other than that, I did well. 1A was really good. Uh, there was nobody got A star in that 
think this is different. It wasn't like the top percentage got A stars or whatever. There was two people that got an A in my entire year. I was one and there was a girl um, called Tara, I think her name was. We were the only ones that got an A in IT in GCSE. Nobody got A stars in that whole year. And then six Bs, they were maxing out because I think at the time you had to go on the advanced uh, paper to get an A or an A star in those subjects. So I was maxing out at a B, uh, if I remember right, because my teachers didn't believe in me enough to submit me onto the advanced one. So they put me into the intermediate, which was slightly easier, but you can only max out at a B. So I was maxing out at the Bs. I got two Cs, maths ain't strong. Um, I think geography was my other one and that F in French. So my GCSEs were pretty solid. And then I went into uh, doing <clears throat> A-levels. Why, I don't know. I wasn't super academic. I hated school. Everything I learned was up till middle school, which was year eight. After that, I stopped learning and essentially I was either self-taught or it's what I knew from before. Because at the end of eight, year eight, I was one of the smartest kids in school. And by the end of year, what is it, 11? The end of year 11, I was, I don't know, just a zombie. But anyway, that last school was terrible. First day of school, I get there and like I came from rough upbringing and it was really rough. I remember seeing one of the lads in my year and he's headbutting a, a glass window of the school and it's cracking in like one of those windscreens does. It's cracking in and everybody's around him going, Aah! I'm like, what have I come to? It's like a riot. That was my first day of upper school. I hated that school, hated it. Hated it with a passion. It was awful. Hated every moment of it. Up until that, it was all right. But that one was terrible. And then I decided, oh, let's stay at this school I hate. So, yeah, I went back to the sixth form to do my A-levels. I went back. To, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I knew I wanted to make money, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. I thought I was going to go to uni. Make my mum proud. So I chose maths, which is one of the subjects I got my C in. I chose English. I chose chemistry. Chemistry I wasn't very good at, uh, maths I was terrible at, and English I was all right at. So I chose those subjects because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I thought, keep it broad. I did mention I wanted to do like IT, and then they had me into the office and gave me this speech about, oh, you, 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 don't, you don't want to go into IT. If you're going to uni, like, they like to teach you IT skills. It was bullshit. It was just a pitch to keep me from there rather than go to college, but I would have been way better at college. But anyway, I stayed sixth form. Uh, I messed around for two years. Uh, I had a great laugh, made friends with some people that I wasn't friends with before because all my actual friends left. Um, and yeah, I had a great time for two years and failed or dropped out of all of my A-levels. I've got one A-level, um, which was in general studies. Notice that's not one I, I talked to you about. So I failed or quit chemistry, failed or quit maths, failed or quit English, literally. How bad's that? And then I, I got one uh, A-level, which was an E grade. And I don't tell people about this. I think it might be the first time I shared it. An E grade in general studies. General studies, you don't do any lessons for in the entire two years. So I did no lessons for it, sat the exam and got an E. So like I've gone from being relatively smart at GCSE, that last year bad, to failing my A-levels, totally failing. Again, if any of this stuff resonates with you, or if any of this stuff you think I should include in my story, please do say. I realise most people won't be watching now, but for the odd one or two that is interested, and has maybe been following me for a few years and is interested in my story, I really appreciate if the bits that stand out to you, even if, if it's multiple comments, please just comment down below. I'm not doing it for engagement. This is not going to go viral. I realise probably less than 100 people are going to actually watch this video. It's okay. But if you could do me that favour and tell me any of the bits that stand out, I'd appreciate it. So I failed my A-levels. And I thought, now what do I do? Wasted two years. Um, I'll go to college and I'll do an advanced GMVQ in business. So I'd, up until that point, I've not been, done business. I did no business GCSE. I did no business um, A-levels. I don't even think they did business A-level. And I don't think they did business GCSE. If they did, I didn't choose it. Anyway, so... I'm 18 now at this stage and I'm going back into uh, into college to do essentially a GMVQ is the equivalent of A-levels to try and get myself into uni. So now I'm, uh, I guess I'm two years older than everyone in my year, I guess. Is that right? Maybe. 
So I'm, I'm in college because I failed my A-levels. I wasted two years, failed them. I'm in college to try and get the ticket again. So I spent the next two years doing an advanced GMVQ in business. That course was amazing. I loved it. That was, that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I didn't love it, love it. Like it was, it was still education and academia. I'm not great with academ academia or education, but I loved uh, that business course. It was a lot more vocational. The advanced GMVQ, I would probably recommend if it's still like that now, way over A levels to anyone. If you're going to do college or whatever, do it, do a, a, va a vocational qualification that's actually going to lead somewhere, potentially, rather than some bullshit. Like, who does history or geography? I'm going to be a history teacher. No, you're not. You're going to work in McDonald's, bro. That's what you're going to do. Because all of these things didn't mean that much back then, and they mean even less in the future. And I know that's going to rub some people up the wrong way. It's not part of my story. I'm just saying it. it, it it's just the way it is. AI is getting so fucking smart, it's terrifying. So if you think... Learning what happened in 1066 with an arrow going in William the Conqueror's eye or whatever bullshit the teacher at school, which is probably all made up nonsense anyway, because as we know, history is written by the victors of war. Uh, not, it's not usually the truth. But if you want to remember all that shit and you think you can run rings around chat GPT or even Google at remembering it and teaching kids 10 years from now, 20 years from now, <laughs> good luck, good luck. Mickey Mouse degree, no point. Anyway, not here to insult anyone. I feel that way about most degrees, to be honest. Unless you're going to use them to get something, there's no point. But I didn't know this at the time. So I did this under advanced GMEQ in business. Um, we're a bit naughty. Can I share how we was naughty? I don't know. I don't know if it matters. I don't think it matters. I don't think anything can go back on me, but I'm going to share a bit of naughtiness. Allegedly, a lot of this work was coursework, and allegedly... One of the kids on my course, one of my mates actually, allegedly, told us that what you can do is you can use this OCR software. You don't need to use it nowadays. You can take a photo and put it into ChatGPT and it will transcribe it all. The times have changed. But, uh, or you could Google it, like you couldn't back then. What he said is you could get books from the library and you could put them on a scanner and use something called OCR software. We're going back over 20 years now and it's optical character recognition software, and it would scan the page in, and then and it would put it into Word. So allegedly, some of my friends, me definitely not, maybe would have uh, gone on and done this, scanned all these pages of all this work into the, into the computer, and then edited it, right click, change synonyms, change a few words around, Biff, baff, boff, everyone's got their coursework done. I'm not saying I did that, but some people would. <coughs> I mean, it's easier now, isn't it? You just type into chat DPT and then tell it not to write like that, write like this and change like this and then boom, you've done it. So it's got even easier now, but allegedly some people on our course did that. Anyway, I I finished that course and I got, uh, a, an ad, uh, what was it called? Um, business... Uh, 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 Advanced GMVQ in business with additional units. So the additional units was for the smart kids. And that helped even more to get you into uni and to position you as a, a smart kid. But there was like four or six exams. I got the best results in the exams in the entire year. Uh, in my old class. Um, and uh, I finished that and I, and I completed it with the best score I could get. So there's like pass, merit and distinction. I got distinction. Um, which <coughs> is a good course and I had good, good lecturers and the freedom of college was great. I would recommend college if you had to do education, recommend college over school, any day. School, they treat you like kids. College, they treat you like adults. And, and uh, the advanced GMEQ was a lot better. So anyway, I came out of that essentially with a, a pass to get to uni because this advanced GMEQ in business was the equivalent of, and it wasn't, I'd done A-levels and I'd done... This business GMVQ, the business GMVQ was a lot easier, but it was the equivalent of, um, <clears throat> I don't know, three A's at A-level or something like that, or th three B pluses or something. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> if you're still with me, I do appreciate it. And if you're doing the comments thing, I appreciate it even more. So I got my pass to get into uni. This is why my story is difficult, because I could say I was a college dropout, but it's like I did well at college there. But then I did bad at 
A level. So it's like, what am I? How do I even tell this story in a way that's succinct and not bloody half an hour long? So um, I got into uh, I, I got into a very prestigious business school. It was Nottingham Business School, which is part of Nottingham Trent University. Um, it was where a lot of smart kids went. To be honest, most of the kids on that course, albeit they were two years younger than me, were absolute dicks. Well, that's how I felt at the time. I didn't like it at all, but I didn't do the right things. I didn't go and live at uni. I lived at home. I travelled in every day, drove in every day. It was a, it was a nightmare. So I didn't get the good bit of the experience of uni and going out with the, like the uni lot. Uh, they were all two years younger anyway, so it's like there was a detachment. You might say two years is nothing. Yeah, two years is nothing if you're thirty-two and they're thirty, but two years when you're twenty and they're eighteen, it's 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 significant. So I'm not saying I was more mature than them, but it definitely was on a different page to them. Anyway, I, I fell in love with this business GMVQ at college, loved it. So I went to do business at uni, and you can see I was like going the right direction. But at uni, at this Nottingham Business School, which was prestigious, they bragged about how they had the highest employer, one of the highest employability rates, or if not the highest employability rate in the country. So essentially, they were bragging about how employable you become after doing this business degree. So the business degree, the business GMVQ, I felt was teaching me how to be a businessman, not very basic level, but teaching me how to be a businessman almost, usable, in the world, real stuff. And then business at uni, this business degree was teaching me how to become an employee and was filling my head with a load of fluff filler, garbage, nonsense. And I'm sorry if you went to Nottingham Business School and you feel different to me, but honestly, that course was an absolute joke. Um, and it sucked. I remember te them teaching us about penis envy. Google penis envy. I think it's where uh, boys or girls, I don't know, it's where one of them looks at the mum or the mum envies, envies the penis of the kid or something. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know what it is. I think I blanked it out of my head from the trauma. What the fuck are they teaching kids that for on a business course? So anyway, <clears throat> I, did, I only did a year and a half of uni and then I quit. But before I quit, and again, there's, really, there's stories in between all of this. But before I quit, um, I started making money online. I was working in a nightclub part time. So I was doing two shifts a weekend at most, or one shift. I was earning five pounds an hour, which was a good wage back then. It sounds terrible now, but it was five pounds an hour for an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, whatever. I'm earning five pounds an hour. I'm doing five hours per shift-ish and doing two shifts or one shift a week. So I either earned 25 pounds a week or I earned 50 pounds a week. And that was to put petrol in my car and have a little bit of money to spend, whatever, a little bit of money to save. And that was uh, whilst I was at uni doing this shit degree that I hated with people I didn't really like that were all like, I don't know, in a, in a city I didn't enjoy, like somebody tried to mug me once and all that stuff. Even though I grew up in Nottinghamshire, Nottingham was like next level at the time. It, the, the, it had the reputation, it was called, it was known as Shottingham because people get shot all the time and there's me driving in and I'm parking up in a rough area every day and walking into uni because it was free parking and walking back to my car and then driving back every day. But anyway, it wasn't too bad. Um, but I, I hated uni. I despised it and they were turning me into an employee. Uh, so I, I had this part-time job. And whilst I'm in this part-time job, only £25 a week, £50 a week, I started a business. Um, and I'll get to this story next. But having started this business, I ended up dropping out of uni after a year and a half because I was making decent money online. So that's the education and young to teenage years mostly dealt with, with a load of side quests and stories. Um, I, I sold concrete squirrels to the dinner ladies. I crinkled up my mates. Um, flower bed, the flowers, took the flowers off my mates, mum and dad's flowers, crinkled them up, dried them in the airing cupboard, sprinkled some of my mum's perfume on to make potpourri, thinking I was going to sell them. I did all kinds of stuff. As a as a uh, like a teenager, um, I did Telecom Plus, but then didn't do it. I did Clean Easy. I did that quite a lot. That's quite an inspirational part of this story that I've not included and almost skipped over. 
um, because I got into personal development, self-development during that, like these tapes that would be motivating and reading books. But yeah, and again, I don't, I don't know how to tell my story really well. I don't know which bits to leave in, which bits to leave out. I realise most people have probably turned out, off, zoned out and be like, what the hell is Matt talking about? But I would love to know which bit. I would love to be able to have somebody invite me to a podcast, ask me my story and then go, these are the bits you need to use, Matt, on your, on your story. Um, that would be cool because I, it's too jumbled in my own head to get the bits that matter onto paper and, and tell it in a short, succinct way so I can tell people about my story without doing this. The 36 minutes so far, probably an hour video by the time I'm done with it. Um, so where was that? So, uh, yeah. So I'm reading books at this stage. Think and Grow Rich, Richest Man in Babylon, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. These iconic self-development books, and I think I got into that from the Clean Easy World because it was multi-level marketing, and my sponsor, this Carl guy, I think it was from Sheffield, is a lovely guy, and he got me into, he started, I think he saw something in me, he saw that passion and that drive, and I didn't do big things in Clean Easy. I, I basically just did the, did, I did a lot of the cataloging and actually selling the stuff, but not so much of the recruiting, and that's where the money is. But anyway, I got into this personal development space and, and started reading books, uh, listening to like tapes and things. Oh, I skipped a bit about hypnosis as well. But anyway, I can't keep banging on about it. So I, I, I quit uni because I was making money on, on a side side hustle. So let me tell you this story. That, you know, this is how side quest it is. So um, during this period of time, late teens, I set up. I, you know what? I can't even tell you the my entire story because I've got so many little things that lead into it. It's just a jumbled mess. Uh, I'll keep going, even though I realise that you're probably bored out of your mind now. Um, so I, while I was at, at college doing my advanced journey VQ, we did a couple of uh, trips with the college lecturers, um, one of which was to the Harrogate Lingerie uh, trade fair. So me and a bunch of kids, we were just teenagers, were wandering around this lingerie trade fair and it was epic. If you ever get a chance to go to a lingerie trade fair, if you're a bloke, then you're definitely going to appreciate a lingerie trade show. Unless they've changed it, they might have. But back then, there was models. There was a beautiful young women dressed in lingerie on these stands. They got like they were modelling their products, and we're all like tongue hanging out. Teenagers filled with bloody uh, young hormones, and there's beautiful women there dressed in these lingerie pieces, and we're wondering about. It. You should have seen the dirty looks they were giving us because we're all walking back, <laughs> giggling like loving it. But anyway, I spoke to, I tried to speak to a bunch of these people selling this lingerie, and it was sex toys as well. I tried to speak to a bunch of these people selling selling lingerie and sex toys. These they were wholesalers and manufacturers and stuff trying to find retailers and, and trade clients. And there's us, kids, dressed with blue backpacks on probably, clearly on a school trip. And most of them did not want to know. They just didn't want to, didn't want to talk to us. They were there to do business. And I, I understand why. But anyway, I spoke to this one guy. Scintillation, the company was called. Uh, and not many people were speaking to them. They made lingerie, but they also sold sex toys. So it was a little bit on the seedier end of it. But I'm a young teenage kid. I didn't care. I love the fact that it, the, the kid was like that. I was like a young lad. Like, I didn't care. It was great. Women in bloody lingerie. And there was like a, a catwalk with models in lingerie. It was amazing. So anyway, um, I spoke to this guy that owned this. I think it was the London-based uh, wholesaler manufacturer of lingerie and sex toys, Scintillation. And he told me about a business model uh, that a bunch of people that he sold to did. And he was, he was so free and giving of his time and effort and energy. And he spoke to me like, um, he spoke to me in such a cool way. Like he didn't go, oh, this is a kid, naff off like most of them did. He actually conversed with me. I don't know why, I don't know, I don't, I don't know why. But he told me about this business model whereby people were doing party plan. And he would have people that were his customers that would buy from him, but they would do parties in, in women's house, either they would do it or they'd have women that did it 
and they would do this party plan. So if you ever knew about Ann Summers, it was Ann Summers parties, but they weren't Ann Summers, they were like your brand of party and you sold his stuff. So I did that, I ended up doing that. Not straight away, maybe it was a year or two later, but I ended up, from that conversation, and him giving me all his brochures and his trade information and stuff and the price and having that conversation, he ended up getting a customer out of that young kid. Um, because what I ended up doing is I ended up recruiting a bunch of girls. I think Jen was my first one. And then I think she recruited Michelle, who was another one. This, these are other stories that are related to this story. Like when I turned up at this Michelle's house, she was in a new build estate, a uh, beautiful big house. To me, she looked like a rich person. And I was, I was driving a banged up first car. It was a banged up 10 year old Fiesta. It had snow tires, it had rust. It was a, a mess. And I'm some 18 year old or whatever kid. And I turn up at, at her house. I parked around the corner so she wouldn't see my car. And I went with a briefcase and I went and knocked on her door. Young, no sales training, didn't have a clue what I was doing. Sat in this nice house and I convinced this woman I didn't need much convincing to be fair, but I talked to this woman, Michelle, and she became like, I think maybe she was my second or third woman to do this party plan, but she, she came on board. So Jen was my first, maybe Michelle was my second, and then there was another one, I forget the, forget the name of her. But I was building this little organization one by one as a teenager, didn't have a clue, based solely off this conversation with this wholesaler that told me about this business model. Um, and... Michelle ended up doing parties uh, many years later after I'd stopped doing it and she'd turn up at my house on the council estate where I live with my mum and she'd come and give me an order and she, we'd have a little chat and, and she'd come and collect this stuff and like I, car I carried it on for years it's like she didn't want to give up on it or something and, and uh, later on she, she told me that uh, why did you park around the corner Matt she knew I'd parked around the corner she saw my car and it was so embarrassing to me at the time I thought it would put her off signing up but it wasn't she didn't care she was nice i would love to meet up with her again now and, and chat about those times because she'd probably remind me of stuff that i totally forgot but yeah there was jen she was doing she did a bunch of parties they would do the party so what they would do is they'd go into people's homes they would have some fun pass the road around a load of these sex toys a little bit of lingerie or whatever and then they'd pass the brochures out they'd play some games have a drink pass the brochures out and then the ladies at the party would uh make an order then the ladies that were doing the parties would share a little bit with the person whose home it was. And then they would come to me with the order forms. I would order the stuff from the wholesaler. Then I would give it back to them. They would give it to the people. And it was essentially just the Ann Summers business model. And, and that was one of the first businesses where I, I did, where it felt like an actual business, not buying some rubber molds and, and pouring plaster Paris in them and trying to sell them as like concrete squirrels to bloody dinner ladies it wasn't that it was like it felt like a proper business real customers real um everything and i like i found all the invoices and stuff the other day in fact they're in a pile over there we get rid of them because we're moving to dubai but i took some photos so i could share my story in the future should this part need to be part of my story so um <clears throat> um so i've got this little business going and and then uh, during that same time the internet is starting to starting to do this, like late 90s, early 2000s, dot com bubble, people are starting to talk about this new internet thing. And I'm like, well, I'm selling lingerie and sex toys to these ladies. What about if I had a lingerie and sex toy website to sell them online? Bear in mind, early days, e-commerce wasn't really a thing. It was early, early days. Um, so I, I had a friend at the time. He was my girlfriend's best friend's boyfriend. And uh, he built websites and maintained website or a website for this uh, company that he worked for as an employee. And I'm like, oh, how do you do this website thing and that? And he said, if you buy a domain name and, and some hosting, I'll I'll teach you I'll teach you how to do it, so you can I can help you build it. I thought that's amazing. So I took my profits from this lingerie and sex toy business. Bear in mind, I didn't make much money. It was a few hundred quid. But I took some of my profits from this business. Um, bear in mind, I'm, I would have been working in the nightclub at that point. So I'm still making my 25 or 50 pound a week. And I'm making a little bit of money on the side doing this party plan business. I take some of my profits. I buy hosting for a year. I think that was 200 pounds. I bought 
uh, domain name, which I feel like it was like 100 quid, but that feels like made up now. It can't have been 100 quid because they're not that expensive, are they? They're like a tenner a year or something now. But anyway, I took two, 300 quid or whatever, poured it into domain name I host him. I bought the bits and bobs and I went back to it and he ghosted me. He ghosted me, he didn't help me. So I'm like, oh, I spent all my money on, on some hosting and domain name. I'm like, what do I do with it now? So hit a roadblock, hit a hurdle, and this is a lesson for you. Find a way over it, under it, around it, through it, whatever. And that's it. That's the key to business. You just hit a roadblock. You go, oh, now what? He told me he was going to help me do this. Like, um, and he didn't. He let me down. I couldn't, I could make, I could have the victim mentality and go, oh, you. But <clears throat> it did me a favor, really, because what I ended up doing is I didn't make an e-commerce website for lingerie and sex toys. <clears throat> that business just carried on for a couple of years or whatever and then kind of petered out over time because I was starting making more money online. Again, skipping ahead a little bit. But I ended up building a website myself, learning how to do it. Bear in mind, it, there was no YouTube. Uh, there was no Google. It was it was Yahoo at the time. Uh, then later, Google was powered Yahoo. We're talking early days of the internet. <clears throat> didn't know how to do e-commerce, so I didn't bother. Built a website about stuff I was interested in. I remember just bullshit on that. I think maybe a little bit of fitness stuff and maybe a bit of attracting women stuff, whatever. Just a load of crap that was just interesting. I remember there were some jokes on the website. I just literally found some jokes online and put them on my website. But what it did is it taught me a few skills. Again, self-taught me a bunch of skills. Uh, I didn't watch courses. I just I downloaded a legal software, a legal, a legal copy of Photoshop. This is well over 20 years ago. I didn't have the money at the time, or I didn't think I had the money at the time to buy it. And Dreamweaver, I started off with front page, I think, but I was downloading these illegal copies of, of full price software. And I was figuring them out on my own with no instructions, no courses to watch. There was no video courses online at the time. <coughs> I'm not used to talking this much, sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm, I downloaded these softwares. And then I start learning how to use them. I, I become semi-proficient in Photoshop. I'm no artist. I'm not really Rolf Harris in his A-Day or whatever. That's probably not a good reference. Um, but, like, I'm not an artist, but I can use Photoshop at this point. Like, late teens, early 20s, whatever it was. And then uh, front page, I could use front page. I could use uh, that Dreamweaver, which was a, a web HTML uh, WYSIWYG. Um, editor. I use front page. I, I use Dreamweaver. I learned Dreamweaver. I learned obviously all the FTP protocol for uploading because it wasn't as easy back then. Like 777, read, write. You, old school dinosaurs will know what I'm talking about. So I, I, I was learning this skill set to build websites and, and I got this skill set to build and design websites. And then I started writing on those websites. I don't know how it happened. Again, I need you to help me distill this story. So if any of this stuff should go in my story, please put it in the comments. But I ended up on some website and uh, read this page and it was interesting. It was a really compellingly written thing. It was all rock text. It was written so well, it drew me through it. And, and at the bottom, there was links out to products. And um, I clicked on these links. And then I noticed at the bottom of these products, there's things sort of called affiliates or webmasters and these little dollar signs. So I clicked on that and I realized this guy on his website is driving traffic through this long form copy, this right written page. Um, like, and, and this is where I started learning affiliate marketing. He's driving them through affiliate links, whereby if he sends traffic to that page and they purchase, then he gets a commission. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I did the same. I essentially, I didn't copy him, but I thought, oh, I'll use the essence of what he wrote. And I took it and I put it on my website. And then I linked up the same people he linked up and set up affiliate links with them and, and then thought no more of it. And I left this website, built the website, learned how to build websites, learned design, how to design using Photoshop and stuff, learned all file transfer protocols and stuff, learned about very early days of pre-selling for affiliate marketing, which I've used to make lots of money since. And it was my first money actually, and I'll get onto that. So I, um, so I uh, had these affiliate links on there. And then one day 
I, I left it. I left the website. Left it. And obviously, with time, Google started ranking this website, and this website started getting traffic. I had no idea, uh, and I just carried on my, about my life and my normal everyday stuff. And then one day, I woke up, and it was days of AOL and dial-up, and I woke up, and it went, you got mail. And I opened my AOL inbox, because that's what it used to do. It used to go, you've got mail. That's the voice it went when you got an email, because it was so new. And I, I clicked on it, and it said, I've made $30. I was like, what? You made, it, this email said I've made, I wish I could still got it. This email said I got made $30. It said I'd, I'd, I, all I'd done is gone to sleep. And I'd woke up, you've got mail, open my email, and in it was a $30 commission email from an Australian that had purchased this product through my affiliate link on the website that I built because I didn't know what to do with my domain and hosting because that guy that was meant to be my friend was meant to help me, let me down. I made $30. That guy not helping me changed my life because it wouldn't have led me down this path. I made $30. $30 at the time with the exchange rates was something like £25, I think. I made £25, which was the same as an entire shift working in a nightclub. Five hours of breathing in smoke. Yeah, they smoked in nightclubs back then. A thousand people smoking, breathing in all night. Music all night, which gave me hearing loss, which I still suffer from now, tinnitus. That five hours of that and giving up my weekends as a teenager and in early 20s, giving up every weekend and, and New Year's Eves and Christmas Eves to work in this nightclub, getting my ears rattled out, breathing in smoke um, to earn 25 quid and I just made it. $30 commission. Just like that. Going to sleep from this bloody website. I didn't even know what we're doing. I just use it as a bit of a hobby to figure out websites. I was I'm blown away. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Oh, there's some skipped story, other stuff. Oh, I really need to talk to somebody and have them extract my story from me. I don't know if anyone offers that service, but I would, not, I would love somebody to hear my story for the first time and, and extract it from me, the best bits, and tell me what that story should be. Because I've, I've skipped some re really interesting stuff uh, at college, but I forget that. And never mind, in business stuff. Anyway, so um, I made this I made this thirty dollar commission. I'm like, oh my god, that's amazing! In my sleep, go to sleep. A few days later, I don't know the exact time frame. A few days later, you've got mail. I made another sale. I'm like, what the? F I just made thirty dollars from that commission. Thirty dollars from that commission. That's like sixty dollars, and that probably happened. Maybe that happened in in the same week. It's like, that's like, I don't know, 50 quid? That's doubled what I would earn from a double shift at the nightclub. It's like, oh my God. And a lot better than selling lingerie and sex toys. Like, even though they, the girls are doing the parties, there's still a little bit of work involved. Like, the wholesale are letting you down. They've not got this in stock, that, got that in stock. So you thought you'd made this much and the party planner had thought they'd made that much and then they haven't and they're out of stock and it was annoying. But there's, there's tr troubles with this. This was just like, Digital. It's like money coming out of nowhere. And what it was is I was a, a, an affiliate for an info product. So it, they would sell a digital product, an info product, and the affiliate commission was $30. And I was making these $30 commissions because I'd learned how to pre-sell by kind of emulating that. They'd call it funnel hacking these days, but by emulating that guy's pre-sale copy to his affiliate links, I had the same really, and I, and it, and it, there was a lot of pennies dropping. Affiliate marketing, how to pre-sell, how to build websites. I was acquiring a skill set, um, and and an eye opening. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> really not used to talking like this anymore. I will be though. So anyway, so um, I'm starting to make money. Fast forward a few weeks, a few months. This money's coming in, this starts rolling in. I'm starting to get like a sale every day, a couple of sales a day. Bear in mind, like, this is crazy. So anyway, I get my income up. I'm making like 300 quid a week from these affiliate commissions. And I'm doing this nightclub job. Anyway, the, the people at nightclub, I've worked there for like, I don't know, years. 
And I said to my girlfriend, still the same girlfriend, first one, that said I'd not do anything with my life, still with her. And I said to her, um, if like I'm gonna have New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve with you this year, I'm gonna have it, I'm gonna book them off, and if they won't let me book them off, I'll quit. That's what I said. So anyway, I went to ask them if I could have these nights off because I worked diligently. I'd worked these important nights for years. Never tried to book them off. Never gave them any trouble. Always there to do the hours. And they were like, "No, you can't. Nobody's having them off." So I was like, I was really upset. I was like, well, I'm going to have to quit then. And they're like, quit then. I was like, I've worked years, gave you this service. And I think a lot of employees have this feeling of they gave so much to their employer and thought the employer like felt something and, and it meant something. And the reality is you're just an employee. And and they just let me go like that. Like, let me walk away. There was no negotiating. It was like, no one's having any time off if you, if you, if you, you know, quit them. So I quit. I was really upset. I was in tears on the way home. I was like, upset because I liked it. I liked working there. They just let me quit like that. I thought I thought I was a valued employee. Clearly, I wasn't. And again, another lesson there, nice and young. Um, skipped that I was a paper boy when I was like 13 and saved up £7 a week to buy a PC and never bought it. I still got that money in my bank account. Skipped that story. Again, any of this resonates, comments, please. If anyone does this, even if it's just one of you that does this, I'll appreciate it. If you've done it proper diligently, I'll really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I quit this nightclub job because I'm making 300 quid a week online and they just let me quit like that. When they found out how upset I was, uh, they were offering me my job back and they tried to get me back. I was like, nah, I'm all right, thanks. So I, I, I left it. Um, I, left, I left the nightclub and never went back, which was the right thing. But anyway, I was making 300 quid a week and then I started going, right, if I can make this much money from this one website with these few pages and these few affiliate links, what can I do if I made more pages? So I made more pages on the website, which increased the traffic and made it rank better in Google. I was like, oh, so I'm about to start making more money. And what if, I could, what if I had multiple websites instead of one website? So I call them feeder sites. I've always called them feeder sites. I don't know if anyone else does, but that's my term from back in the day. And I created more feeder sites. So I've got more pages on each site. I've got more feeder sites. So I'm making these uh, websites and I'm putting affiliate links on them, driving traffic. So I'm learning about traffic driving, SEO, affiliate marketing. I'm building up these skill set one by one, self-taught, accidentally stumbling from one thing to the next. And I'm making more money. At one point, I've got like 10 feeder sites that have got plenty of pages on them. But I've all built myself and I'm just building feeder sites. And what, what did I get it up to? I think I got it up to $300 a day. A day, seven days a week. Bear in mind, I wasn't writing stuff. I wasn't doing sales calls. I wasn't doing anything. I was building assets. Again, a nice young uh, lesson for you. Build assets. Don't exchange your time for money. Exchange your time for assets. Don't exchange your time for money. See, there is some value here. If you've stuck with me an hour listening to me talk about myself. I apologize. So anyway, so um, um so I've got I've got a bunch of websites that rank in Google. I'm learning about SEO, I'm tweaking things, I'm learning how to rank higher, I'm learning how to write better copy, I'm learning how to design sites uh, more, I'm learning how to I'm learning how to do, do all these things and I get it to about $300 a day. Off of memory, top of my memory. Ish. Some days will be higher, some days will be lower, but about $300 a day. Bear in mind, council estate kid told he would do nothing with his life. I got this little network of sites. I'm an affiliate. I'm starting to make decent money. And then I think to myself, well, hang on. I'm an affiliate for these guys selling information. Why can't I sell information? It was like another penny drop moment. So I thought, you know what? I'll take this skill set I've built doing this design, writing, SEO, <clears throat> all this stuff. Take this skill set and I'll make my own info product. So then after years of promoting these info products, uh, and it wasn't just them, it was all that I started adding other uh, uh, info products. But after years of, of uh, promoting these info products and an affiliate, I thought I'll make my own info product. So I made my own info product. Um, and uh, essentially, um, I swapped out the links. Just I just went off in tangents because there's more stories like... The, Again, I'll go on. I'll go. I'll go down the tide. And why not? The guy that I emulated the affiliate pre-sell text off. When I say I emulated, I wrote it in my own words, and I thought that was enough. Uh, on Christmas Day, 
He sent me an email. He must have saved it till Christmas Day, unless he was a twisted, horrible fellow. He sent me an email saying, uh, it's not my intention to educate you on the law, but I'm suing you because you've copied my uh, stuff. And, and he sent me this really well-written email saying he was going to sue me for stealing his content. I never stole his content. I have a theory as to how he found out about it, but I never stole his content. I mean, one theory is maybe he was the merchant and the affiliate and that he lost his really good affiliate, me. And maybe that's how he figured out because he like looked into it or something and found me. But then there was another, there was a website on there that wasn't a legitimate website. It was just one that he'd clearly made. And I think I put that on my website, not knowing. So he'd have seen the referrer traffic coming from my website and then seen that I'd wrote this letter. But anyway, on Christmas day, Christmas fucking day, I get an email. I'm a kid still. I'm in like late teens, early 20s, whatever. On Christmas day, I get an email saying I'm suing you. I'm shitting myself. It ruins my Christmas. And then I go see a solicitor. And uh, again, another lesson for you. She said, I explain the situation. She says, I'm not going to charge you. It's just a little bit of advice. Um, and, and she put my mind at rest and she told me what to do. Bless her. And I told her for that, when I next have a legal problem, I'm going to come to her first. When I've got a legal problem that I'm going to pay for. But she gave me this free advice. She said, you're a man of straw, Matt. There's no point them suing you. What you got to sue for. And I was like, I didn't realise that at the time. We didn't have Google. We didn't have ChatGPT. We didn't have YouTube to watch videos. And she's like, I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. If he would have sued me, it would have cost him a fortune. He'd have got nothing. I had no assets. I live with my mum and dad. I got a little bit of money in the bank, but not much. Like... I had no assets. I was a man of straw. Um, so she, she was like, take it down, uh, blah, 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 and ignore him, and you're all good. And I did that. I took it down, ignored him, and it was all good. It never, never came to anything. He achieved his goal of getting me to stop doing what I was doing, uh, I guess, and that's really what he wanted. Um, and there was no legal stuff come of it. And here's another lesson for you kids. Like, if you can avoid court, do. Because they always say the only winners are the lawyers. And generally speaking, it's true. If you're young and filled with bloody testosterone, you might be like, oh, I'm going to sue you to try and do them in. But honestly, you'll lose. I don't, even, if you, even if you win, you'll lose. Like, it's just no point. The winners are the, like the lawyers. Um, but anyway... I digress. Again, going off on tangents. If any of this stuff in the, should stay in the story, please tell me the bits that maybe made you go, oh, that was cool, or engaged you, or whatever, so I can I can make a succinct story. Leave them in the comments down below. I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna look this in a week's time to see if I've got no comments. But like, okay, I talked to myself for over an hour. Thanks. This I've never been in the, this in depth with anybody ever in my life about my story. This is the most I've ever revealed about my story, my origin story, if you like. And it's a mess, isn't it? So anyway, um, built all these websites, driving this traffic. I thought I'll build my own info product. So then, so then, by accident, right from the start, from failing uh, college and and um, like, did I tell you I dropped out of uni after a year and a half? Yeah, I did. All, all that stuff, going to that trade fair, talking to that man, starting to sell lingerie and sex toys, to then getting a website. My mate let me down. So I built a website, put some affiliate links on it accidentally, made some sales. Wow, I'm now a webmaster uh, that's learned all these skills of marketing and early days internet stuff. And then, and then now I'm building an info product. And this was what changed my life. This, the affiliate marketing I've made hundreds of thousands of from, for sure, I don't know exactly. I don't, I don't know if I made a million plus from affiliate marketing. Maybe without looking and without trying to crunch the numbers, I don't know. You try and find accounts from 20 years ago, 23 years ago, or whatever. They, have, they make you keep them for like five, seven years or whatever. And we're moving to Dubai. I've been burning loads of stuff. So it's like from 10 years ago and stuff. So a lot of the story, if you like, or the proof of the story is lost. But it is what it is. It's fine. Um, what, what was I saying? Uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, so anyway built this info product. I thought if I can build uh, a similar info product 
and then swap out my links. So instead of promoting as an affiliate somebody else's as, uh, as a uh, product, I can create an info product and promote my own because I've learned how to drive traffic. I've learned how to do pre-selling. Uh, I've learned so many skills to get to that point and making $300 a day. And then I thought, if I do that, then I'll be able to get, I'll not just get a commission, I'll get the uh, entire money for it. So I did that and I built my first info product. It is okay. Um, and I swapped out my links. So instead of promoting that stuff as an affiliate, I started promoting my own stuff. And my income jumped from $300 a day to $450 a day straight away. You might say, oh, that's not good. The commissions were really high. I can't remember what it was. 70% or something stupid like that. 50%, I don't know. No, 70%. It was high commission, whatever you could, it was on clickbank.com and whatever the highest commission was, I think that's what they paid. Um, so then I got an info product and I would bump my income to $450 a day by just taking that traffic from my stuff and sending it to my own info product, which was like mind blowing. Bear in mind, I'm a kid that was told, no, 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 you can't have this, you can't have that. Um, my entire life, I'm like, like, and here I am making serious money. At this point, $450 a day, what's that? At the time, probably 350 quid a day. I'm making more money than anybody I know at that point. More money than anybody I know. Check this out, right? So this is a nice little interesting twist that you'll like. So I'm still, I'm still with the same girl. I, went, I was with her 10 years in the end. The one that said, you'll never make anything of your life. You never do anything, blah, blah, blah. And I go out with the guy that was meant to help me. Uh, not go out with him like that. Go out drinking. Yates's. I remember it was Yates's in Mansfield. And we was on a night out. It was me and my girlfriend. My girlfriend's best friend and her boyfriend. So the guy that originally told me, buy a domain name and hosting. And I'll help you build a website. I still know him. I still talk to him. But he just didn't come through for me. He didn't help me like he said he would. He made me waste my money. And then just ghosted me on it. So I'm out with, in, in Mansfield in Yates's. And I'm drunk. And he's drunk. I'm a bloody teenager or whatever I am, very early 20s or, or, or teenager, I can't remember. And uh, uh, I don't know if he asked me, I, I bought a new car anyway, I don't know if he saw my car, but I bought a new car, it was the first car, it would have been about 21 I guess, ish. I don't know, I need to get the time frames and stuff sort of like in my head, but I'm not going to be able to. It's just a big jumbled mess. But I, anyway, I bought a Ford Puma. It was second hand. It was £8,000, I think. It was the first good car I'd had. Up until that part, car point, I'd had Fiestas that were dropping to bits, a Ford Orion. I'd had a Peugeot 306, which was a disaster. I'd had just bad car after bad car. And at this point, I was making real money. So I bought myself a Ford Puma, uh, a second hand Ford Puma. Like I said, it was about £8,000. And I went out on a night out with this guy and my girlfriend and his missus. And uh, he said, how have you afforded that about my car? Bear in mind, it's only an eight grand second hand Ford Puma, but I'm still, I guess I still live with my mum and dad at that point. I would have done, I would have thought. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. And, and I just bought like a, a new car, like better than any cars around us. Most cars were bangers. It's like, how do you afford that? And I'm drunk and I'm not thinking I've got to uh, be humble or, or whatever. I'm just honest. He asked me a question and, uh, and I gave him an honest answer. And I remember saying, and, and I can't remember the exact time frame, what year it was and all that stuff. But I remember saying, because um, I made 144 grand this year, something like that. We're going back over 20 years ago. My memory is hazy from what I did last week, never mind 20 years ago. But, but just so don't hold me exactly on to the precise date and time and numbers, but it was about, I think I said something like, I made 140 grand or 144 grand this year. And he was like, mind blown. His mouth dropped open, he wasn't happy for me. I think that was the last time I saw him. How's that for a story? So the same guy that let me down, he never. I don't think he ever spoke to me again after that, if I remember right. Um, I think that was it. I think that was the last time I saw him. I need to go back and talk to people I knew back then and I don't know any of them. I'm not with the girlfriend. I don't know him. I don't know his missus. I don't know any of them, but I'd love to go back to remember some of the details. But um, I made 144 grand. Bear in mind, this is a kid. 
that was making £25 a week driving a 10-year-old uh, Fiesta around and just able to afford fuel. And, and I made 140 grand. He was like, and that was it, that was it. That, that's an early story for you. That's a, an early lesson for me. I'm not sure I learned that lesson, but people, maybe people ask questions they don't like the answer to. And when you give them the answer, they fall out with you for it. And, and, and British people, English people, yeah, English people particularly, a lot of them don't like success. They don't celebrate success. It's not like the American dream or the Dubai dream. It's the opposite. A lot of them don't celebrate success. And, and yeah, I don't think we spoke again after that. I think he, he stopped being my friend. Not that he's a great friend anyway, but, but I don't think we saw each other again after that. Anyway, so I was making good money at this point. Um, um, where, where I'm at. So I've got my info product. And I'm driving traffic, I'm making good money, I'm like, this is this is good. And I thought to myself, um, I, I, I get time frame, distant memories, but I remember being a little bit worried because all my traffic was coming from Google. I thought, I'm building a house on sand, SEO. I was good at SEO, I found a few hacks and, and I was good at it and I was ranking well. I'd build a website, I could get it to rank well. And I thought, what if... Google changed something in the algorithm. I am absolutely screwed. I'll go from making good money to no money. So I was like, I need to do something. So I set about transitioning some of my traffic out of the SEO realm, me driving the traffic myself. And I thought if I build an army of affiliates, then they can send me traffic. However, they get the traffic and I'll just pay them a commission. So essentially I'd gone from affiliate promoting a merchant or an info product to uh, a merchant recruiting affiliates. So I had affiliates and I started to get some traction with the affiliates and, and I, it started to be an increasing part of my money. Um, so I was getting SEO money and I was getting aff affiliate driven sales and I'm the merchant. So, so like I'm driving my own traffic and other people are driving traffic at this stage and my, my income's increasing. So then I thought, what if I make multiple websites, multiple info product sites? So I start building more info product sites. So one became two, two became three, three became four, four became five. Each time I'm building a new website, um, I'm designing the website myself. I'm, I'm learning copywriting. Copywriting is probably the biggest leverage skill that I ever learned. But I'm learning copywriting as I'm <clears throat> building these sites and I'm testing these sites. So I'm split testing these sites. Early days, <clears throat> split testing, Taguchi testing, multivariate testing. Most people never heard of that in this space. I'm split testing headlines. I'm split testing colors. I'm split testing call to actions. I'm split testing first paragraphs. I'm split testing images. <clears throat> I'm split testing like crazy to drive these revenues up on these sites. And I'm building new sites all myself. <clears throat> I'm learning copyright. I'm learning design. Each site, some of them get better. Some of them get quicker. Some of them get better written. Some of them get better design. But I'm <clears throat> acquiring this skill set of design, SEO, copywriting, pre-selling from an affiliate point of view, uh, the technical side of it, creating products. And then I start outsourcing. So it's like, I'm fast forwarding now because this is like the exciting bit, I guess, from a, from a business point of view, not my early days. This is the exciting bit. I'm, and I'm, I start outsourcing. So, um, I again, funny stories come off funny stories, really. But I met a guy. I had a forum. I had a community as well. Again, I had a community. Uh, and I was learning how to manage a community and build a community and, and, uh, and all that stuff. And I had a guy in this community. Um, and ended up working with him. And he told me he was uh, 28. And I started working with him. And he's writing for me. So I'm, I'm, in the, I'm basically an info product website game at this stage. And I, and I think he might be the first person that worked for me, if you like, in this space. On any consistent basis. I essentially, he wasn't an employee, but he was a subcontractor. But I essentially had this young lad. I found his, I found his invoices while I was going through the papers to get rid of to go to Dubai um, and and it was like charging me like five pound an article or something like that it was crazy but um, 
He told me he was 28. It later turns out years. I'm working with him years here. And and on some adult stuff, like I'm 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 some of my web, web, websites are like, like, like about sex and uh premature ejaculation and all kinds of stuff in this info product space. You name it, I've sold it. Budget theme weddings, beekeeping, uh, smoothie making, raw dog food diets, uh attracting women, just fit, weight loss fitness, uh all of which never any make money products. And that's all I ever wanted to talk about. That's all I ever wanted to do. Never met any make money products. All the my original info products for well over 10 years, none of them were in the make money space, which is bonkers. But anyway, so I was actually doing it, building these info products, and I was outsourcing at this stage to this lad who told me he was 28, who I met through my community. Turns out, I think when he started working with me, he was either 16 or 15 or something like that. He's just lying to me. I never met him until years later. I met him in person. But, but like, uh, he's, 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 he's writing stuff for me. He's a kid. I'm thinking he's an adult. He's writing on adult stuff. It's like, wow. But anyway, uh, so that's a cool little side note. Again, my story is so lumpy and bumpy. If I do appreciate if you any of this stuff resonates. Stuff I should definitely include, at least. I realise you're not going to do the entire thing. That would be like, ah, uh, thank you. But like any of this resonates with you on the first time of hearing it, let me know. But anyway, so then I start working with this other guy, uh, Larry. He's an American, same thing, across the pond. He's a bit ex uh, eccentric, different skill set, but he was a writer. So I got a couple of writers. John was good at design, this young lad. Uh, Larry was just good at writing. So I got that. And then I outsourced onto, I don't know what website it was, but I, I used one of these like Upwork, I think it might have even been at Upwork, but whatever that was called back in the day, but it might not be. Um, and I paid a lady a thousand dollars to write me this uh, 30 page ebook. E the ebook was absolutely garbage and it became a bestseller. It wasn't because of her writing, her writing was awful. It was literally the worst product ever. But my sales letter and the design and the branding and my marketing made it the best selling product that I was aware of in that space um in that niche it was that particular one was uh and it was an accident it wasn't my bright idea i wanted to outsource the writing of an attract women book how to attract women for men but i ended up outsourcing it to this lady because she made me the bid and she looked all right it, like and, it, and she was a lady so I'm like oh i could create a, a how to how to attract women by a woman and I thought that was a groundbreaking idea 20 odd years ago, um, even though it's probably like pickup artists nowadays would say, yeah, women aren't the best people to teach men how to pick up women. And they're not because what women think they want and what women actually want is two different things. And not many women are very aware of that. But anyway, she wrote me this garbage ebook. It was rubbish. It was awful. And I ended up making it a bestseller in the space. I don't like it, it was doing really, 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 really well. So I'm making tens of thousands from this, so I, I got all these things. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning outsourcing at this stage, and I wouldn't say I got an info product content factory, but I definitely got some firepower there. I was talking, taking some of my money, money putting it back in, investing into to having building a small like team here and there, one-offs, regular people. Larry I worked with regular, John I worked with regular. Uh, this girl, I can't remember her name, but that was a one-off, never working with her again. Even though I saw her bragging about how she was responsible for writing this product because it, it, it had done so well. Uh, so she was taking the juice from it, which is fine, whatever. She did write it, even though it was bad. So anyway, um, keep building. And at, at some point, I decide I'm going to stop building. I'm going to have other people build. So this was the mid-2000s now. And I... Uh, Find out about uh, recruiting Filipinos from a guy called John Jonas, who was, I think it was selling an info product at the time. Later on, he created a job platform for Filipinos that's still there now and still a lot of people use it. But um, I learned through him about recruiting offshore workers, Filipinos. I think this is before like seven hour work week or four hour work week or whatever it's called, which I've, I own, but I've never read. I've been I've been told it talks about like outsourcing and stuff, but like I, at one point I had, and again there's so many off stories from this. If and when you ever join my coaching or mentorship groups, 
we can I'll probably share little tidbit stories and go deeper into them. Not like this bloody two hour monster, just bit that bits that actually got lessons in them. But like um uh, at one point I had eight full time Filipinos that were created a contact factory. Um and later on, the guy that got me onto John Jonas uh, was actually shocked how deep I was using my Filipino VAs because he'd used them for low-level tasks like answer my emails and stuff. And I was using them. I'd got uh, writers that were writing feeder sites, content sites, uh, that were trained on SEO. I'd got a designer, a designer that was designing like the header graphics and stuff. I'd got um, a copywriter that was almost as good at me at copyright. She was so good, but I only kept her a little bit. I think she stayed with me a couple of months, which is a shame. Um, but it's like, and then I got a manager. So I got like eight full-time team of Filipinos and they were pumping out products. Now, most of those products were absolute shit and the niches were bad. I didn't give them enough direction. I just kind of left them. But I had experience of building an offshore team, paying them, pennies on the dollar um, and managing that team. And, and I learned all about outsourcing, recruiting VAs, training VAs, managing VAs. It's like another one of the skill sets to stack on top of the other skill sets. Now, uh, as of right now, I don't know how big our team is around the world, but maybe this, without counting, maybe there's 50. There's probably somewhere between 30 or to 50 full-time people. I don't mean VAs, I mean... Uh, I mean, subcontractors, VAs, everything, staff, employees, I'm probably between 30 and 50. I don't even know. I don't even know most of them's names because we've got kind of levels in place and I'm here and I'm totally detached from a lot of it. But this is 20 years later. But anyway, I'm in the mid 2000s. I've got this eight man team of Filipinos. One of the Filipinos from back then still works for us now on our new businesses, which is mind blowing, bonkers, uh, absolutely nuts. But um, so I've got this team of content creators building stuff and I'm expanding my empire. Anyway, long story short, there's not long story long. Um, I made a bunch of money. I made a bunch of money selling info products, a bunch of money. But more than the money, I learned a skill set, copywriting being the main, the biggest catapulter of success copywriting split testing, affiliate marketing, like pre-selling, persuasion. I built a, 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 I won't reveal what I call it, but I built a psychological sales system that works across anything. You put it into a webinar, it works. You put it into a long form sales letter, it works. You put it into an ad, it works. You put it into email sequence, it works. You name it, you put it into it, it just converts really, 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 really well. I developed these things, these systems and these skill sets and stuff over time to building this stuff. Anyway, I'm coming on to the late 2000s now. I'm essentially semi-retired. I hate what I do. Bear in mind, this sounds like a dream come true when you look back at it, but I was, uh, I would, for the vast majority of that time, once I quit uni, after a year and a half, teaching me how to be an employee, not a business owner, teaching me about penis envy, um, I was uh, essentially in a bedroom, at home, on my own, in my pants. When I say I made most of my money in my sleep, I mean it, I did. I made a fortune in my sleep because I was building assets and I was changing time for money. Digital assets. Um, I was in my pants. That sounds like a dream for a lot of you that have to go out to work and you work with dickheads that you hate and managers that you hate. But that was not the dream for me. I hated it. I'm on my own in my 20s. I'm on my own. I go to the pub, like, on a Tuesday, I go to a quiz with my mates. On a Friday, we go to the pub. Like, I'd see my girlfriend come home from work and stuff. But essentially, I'm on my own, at home, in my pants, earning a fortune. And I would look for things to do with my time. Because it, it didn't... Once I got to about the mid 2000s, I essentially stopped working and took my foot off the gas. Uh, I dipped in and out, um, but my Filipinos were doing the thing and my websites were doing the thing. I'd got this mature business. I got an affiliate army. I got traffic still coming in from 
Google, which bear in mind that, that call about the affiliate, building the affiliate traffic as opposed to just relying on Google, that was a good, uh, a good decision because Google did some Panda update or something. They did one, one, of their, one of their updates, they call them a different thing, but one of their algorithm updates happened and all my uh, sites went to shit, but I still got my affiliate traffic. So it's like, that's another lesson for you. Foresee what might happen and, and adjust now to maybe adjust for it in the future. Because these businesses, they're not speedboats. I often use this analogy with my business partner, Karen, when I'm trying to coach her. Um, these businesses aren't like speedboats. As much as you want them to be, you can't just go, oh shit, there's something in the water, quick, let's dodge it, and scoot around it, it doesn't work like that. They're more like cruise liners. They take a lot to get going, but once they go in, they're really good. But then if there's icebergs ahead, you've got to turn really early because the turning is slow. And, and it's like if you're relying on Google traffic, well, you've got to see that could be an iceberg in the future. It's great while it's cool, but there's icebergs in the water. You're not responsible for your traffic. So you've got a diversified traffic source. I diversified into affiliate. The iceberg came, I'd steered around it. That was the affiliate traffic. The Google traffic later came back and stuff, but but like, I, I hope there's a few lessons in here for you, and I hope you're able, somebody's able to do me the favour of going through this and telling me what it, the important bit is, telling me on the first time of hearing it, which bits are like should go in my final story, because there's other offshoot bits like my best friend I met in the gym, told him selflessly how to do this business model with info products. Coached him exactly how to do it. Every question he gave me, he was the first person I taught how to do it. Um, and he went from making some shit apprenticeship wage, doing like steel drawings or something, to I think he made 42 grand or something like that in his first year online in his spare time, just doing what I said. And uh, he, I used to help him. I helped him get his income up. And then he started competing with me. He's competing with me on keywords, on keys, like in the search engines. He didn't use the knowledge and go build his own thing. He literally copied my stuff and he's competing with me. I'm like, what the fuck? And here's me giving my, at the time, best friend information on how to make money online. And it's working. He's making a fortune because he's 42 grand. I think it was his first year. I think he made way more than that. And he's competing with me. And, and um, one day we was in the pub with our mutual friends uh, and one of them disrespectfully said to it in front of him and to him, oh yeah, but you're only making that money because of Matt. Um, and it wasn't right of him to say that, but there was some element of truth in it. And my best friend at the time denied it. I was like, no, no, it's not because of him. It's just all myself. And I thought... I felt a bit butthurt. Again, I'm a lot more humble in my old age and a lot. I try to detach from my ego a lot more because I, I don't think it serves me. But at the time, I was like, I was like, hang on, I've asked you for no money. I've guided you and I helped you with every question you've ever got to tell you how to print money online. And you use that information to compete with me, which I didn't fall out with you over and I still help you. And now in front of our mates, you won't even say, yeah, Matt's a legend. Like, Matt's amazing. And, and, like, I know that's ego. I know that I shouldn't feel like that and I shouldn't have felt like that at the time and probably would feel like that less now. Or, or maybe, I, I don't know, my expectations of humanity have lowered somewhat. So I've adjusted to how the real world is somewhat. Um, so I wouldn't expect it. But, but, like, it didn't even give me any credit in front of our mutual friends, even though they knew that it was that and I taught him how to do it. And the very least I would expect... I guess back then is some appreciation and for him to go, for him to go, yeah, he's a fucking legend. And he didn't, he denied I even helped him. I was like, wow, I literally not just helped you, I helped you compete against me. I'm literally making less money because you are selling, you are competing with me in the search engines on my keywords, like selling something other than my stuff. So um, he might remember it differently, but that's how I felt at the time. So at that point, I stopped helping him. I thought, okay, all right. If if this is all you, mate, I still be a friend. I didn't fall out with him. I didn't even have this conversation with him. Didn't I? Didn't tell him this, but this is the mindset I went through. I thought, okay, if that's if that's how you feel, cool. And then after that, I didn't answer a single question. He'd come to me and be like, oh, 
Mate, I'm struggling with X, Y, Z. Like, what, what, what do you do about that? Or, or what would you do? Or how do I fix that? I'm like, I don't really know, mate. I'm not really sure. I went from being his absolute, genuine free mentor to getting zero credit for it, zero money, and him actually taking money from me because he's competing with me. And I thought, and I didn't answer his questions. And his business did this. And it went to nothing. So he did, did this while I was helping him. Did this when I stopped. And, I, and you know what? I don't know if that was right of me to do that. I don't know if there's karma. I don't know if that was the right thing to do. But essentially, I'm not sure what he's done with his life. I think he moved halfway around the world. And I've got no animosity towards him now. Like, I've got no problem with him. Um, I don't know if he, see, if he knows that I felt that way and that was the turning point. But I stopped helping him. I don't know what he's doing now. I don't know if he's doing all right for himself. No idea. Maybe he's doing bigger and better things and good on him for years. I hold no ill feeling towards him. But me and him end up not being friends like a bit after that, I don't know if it was a year after, two years after, a few months, I don't know, but we ended up not being really friends anymore, so I didn't really see him. So anyway, and like I say, moved, moved across the world. So that's the tangent. So I've got this info product factory, essentially, in the Philippines. Never been to the Philippines, never met any of them. But I got them managing each other, I got them recruiting each other, I got them training each other. I'd done this thing in a, in a bigger way than most people were doing it back then. Uh, and I'm making a bunch of money on info products and I hated it. I hated my life. I hated what I was doing. I was like, I was making it, I would do about two hours work a week. No, two minutes work a week, sorry. Two minutes. Two minutes. It was just all done for me. I was like retired in my late 20s. Mid to late 20s, just retired. They would just do everything and I would just not do anything. I would check my stats. That was the two minutes work I did. Make sure my websites was online. If, if like, why was that website gone down? Like, and that was it. Just, all right, it's fine now. That was all I did. So it's like I retired making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, and I didn't keep my foot to the floor, which I should have done. I didn't. I essentially stopped playing World of Warcraft for two weeks, did nothing other than that. And then stopped because I realised it was a toxic thing. And I would sit. I don't know, my life felt shit. It felt awful. Even though I'm making all this money, I'm not doing anything for it. And as much as you guys might hate having to go to work and be told what to do, I understand that. Uh, I hate being isolated alone. Now I can't sit staring at a wall. If I'm in a restaurant and somebody makes me sit towards a wall, I don't like it. I'm not okay with it. I have to sit looking towards the room. Part of that is upbringing and always knowing my surroundings. What, like, and part of that is being a man. And, and just, you've got to defend, like, part of that's the, like, the council estate upbringing of having to know who's around you because you never know when you're going to get jumped. You never know when you're going to be in a fight. And then part of it is like, I was staring at four walls on my own, isolated in my pants, doing nothing. It was awful. I hated it. So anyway, I thought, do I buy a Lambo? With some of my magic internet money, do I buy a Lambo? Or do I buy a nightclub? And I weighed it up for a while. Bear in mind, I've, I bought Audi R8 at this point. At this point, I'd had a... I'd had a Ferrari. Anyway, I don't know. I've, bought, I've had Ferraris. I'd had Audi R8. So I'm not saying it to brag. I hated the Ferrari. I, I liked the Audi R8. That was good. I recently had an Aston Martin Vantage. Hated it. I'll never buy a Vantage again. I'll never buy an Aston Martin again the way, with the way I was treated by that dealership. Uh, by the guy, the main guy at the dealership. Awful. Awful. It's destroyed the Aston Martin brand for me. I would recommend nobody buys an Aston Martin ever. Even though I love the pedigree of the brand, how he's treated me was disgusting. But anyway... Side note, tangents, done enough of that with one hour 35 in. I wonder if there's anybody watching this. I'm not sure even Holly would watch this. She don't even watch my 10 minute videos. The man, one hour 35 minute videos. I don't think I've made one this long, this long before. This is my story from start to finish. And I could still make it double as long because I keep thinking of things I forgot that I could include. Um, so I, I, I bought a nightclub. I bought a nightclub. It was, and here's a, here's a little nice little side note. I didn't buy the Lambo. Still never bought a Lambo. Uh, it's probably the only car that I wouldn't mind buying, actually. But I, the Huracan has just been replaced, and I, I don't know. Um, I like the Huracan. When I get to Dubai, maybe I'll buy a Huracan. We'll see. Um, anyway, so um, hopefully you've tracked my story at this point. You've seen that I was a, a rough, council estate kid with nothing. 
and I ended up acquiring a bunch of skills almost accidentally. Great determination, hard work, belief, desire, self-development, all these things, this concoction of the last what has brought me to almost here. Well, it's the late 2000s, early early 2010s now, bought a nightclub. It was an old pub. I worked in when I was 16. My brother got me a glass collecting job. Uh, as a, when they were busy, I was 16 and I went in this, into this uh, pub and uh, it was a glass collecting job. And first night I had this big stack of glasses, pipe pots over my head and I dropped them. And I still remember the face of Stuart, the landlord at the time. And I oh, fuck's sake, thinking, you know, oh, this kid. Dropped him on the floor. Anyway, I bought that pub uh, that, was, that had been turned into a strip club. So I had a 4am licence because of the strip club conversion. Uh, so it was an old shutdown strip club when I bought it. But it was also the pub I, I worked in when I was 16 as a glass collector. And I bought it cash with internet money that I'd done in, this, with this journey, this info product journey. So I bought it um, and opened it as a nightclub that played R&B and hip hop. Um, but I worked in there as a kid and I ended up buying it. How amazing is that? And I thought I'd get it open for this much money. I thought, yeah, I can do it for, for that done easy. Here's another lesson for you, especially with commercial property. If you, if you think it's gonna cost you this, it's not, it's gonna cost you this. So I thought it would cost me this, and it didn't, it cost me that. So I put a fortune into this thing. I thought, Lambo or a nightclub, yeah, yeah, it was a lot more than Lambo, trust me. But I met my girlfriend there, my current girlfriend, uh, Holly, who's left me the most beautiful message earlier. She's gone to get her hair done, and she's left me a message saying, uh, like, basically my food's in the fridge. It was such a nice, lovely message. But anyway, um, Bought this nightclub. Again, got into a nightclub game. Never run a nightclub. Yeah, all right, I got some money this time, but I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue. I didn't know anything about licensing or, or beer or breweries or barrels of stuff or premises licenses, personal licenses, PRS licenses, PPL licenses. I didn't know about the headache that the police give you, I didn't know about the headache the council give you, there's so many stories of those days I could make a TikTok channel and you wouldn't believe some of the stories from those days. It's like a gangster film. Running a nightclub is like being in a gangster film and I wasn't the gangster. And the gangsters that actually were gangsters, that are your customers, some of your customers, they weren't even the biggest gangsters. Like I got so many stories from those days, but it's probably not something I want to share on here. Maybe when I'm in Dubai, I'll share it because I ain't coming back that often. Um, but yeah, it's been some, I mean, it's some corruption and some craziness from those nightclub days. But anyway, it was a journey. Some amazing, uh, amazing stories. I won't go into all that. Bought a nightclub. Uh, so then I got my internet money. This is early 2010s. So 2012, 2013, something like that. I don't know. I got my internet money. Bear in mind, I've been running that with zero work for years. I've done nothing on that for years at this point. Years. I did nothing for years. Zero work. Uh, I got my internet money. I got and and I bought the nightclub thinking I'll I'll probably break even or make a little bit of profit on trading the nightclub, but I'll make money on the property. It turned out it was the opposite way around. I lost money on the property. I don't know how you do that, but I lost money on property um, and I made money on the nightclub. But I my nightclub that was, ended up, I did, I did really well. We were like the number one club for a significant period of time. Even though we was at the other, other end of the town, we emptied the town. The town emptied from where they like to control the flow of people and where all the main pubs and bars and clubs and stuff were and they all came down towards, it was crazy. Um, but like, so I had in, my nightclub money, I had the internet money, but I focus, what, here's another lesson for you, what you focus on grows, what you ignore dies. And what ended up happening is the internet money, whilst it didn't die altogether, it definitely started dropping. And I'm a few years into the nightclub, you know, this part of my story, 
And I'm, I've employed a manager. I've employed a couple of managers. I've had two managers steal loads of money from me and had to sack them. Both of them steal, stole from me. I sacked that one because he stole from me. Employed this one, uh, telling her, like, you can't, like, I'm, I'm sacking him and, like, I can't believe he stole from me. She did the same. She stole from me as well. But I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying enough attention. It was a cash business. I was learning. There's so much moving parts in that business anyway. And I was, I had no mentor. No one to help me as usual. I just figured it out. And we became the club in town for a period of time. Like we were the place to be. Um, and it was epic. And and it was great. And, it, and I was like a little mini celebrity in the town for a bit. It didn't last. But, but like it was like amazing. It was amazing. But... Um, so I sacked those two, and then I employed another one that I still know today, still consider a friend today, um, and she was good. She didn't steal from me. Um, but yeah, so, but anyway, my point was she ran that. And again, what I focused on, what I focus on usually grows. I don't want to say I've got the Midas touch, because I don't, and that's ego-driven bullshit. But what I tend to focus on and pay attention to works well, and what I don't, tends to die. It's just my experience. I hate that. My ultimate goal is to have something whereby I don't have to give it any attention and it grows. Not just maintains, it grows. That's hard. That's really hard. But anyway, so I'm not focusing on the internet business. And over a period of, I don't know, five, six, seven years, it slowly does this to like, it's still probably better than your average income, but it wasn't what it once was. And then my nightclub, because I'd stopped paying attention to that too, had started doing this. So I'd gone from making really good money in two businesses, and it was multiple businesses within those businesses, but to really good money in, in a couple of businesses to like, oh, I'm, I'm like, this sucks, and this is kind of gone. So it's like, I, I don't want to paint this picture of, oh, I've made millions every year for years. No, I've lived like a retired person. I've lived like a bum, not doing anything. For many years and it's not the best way to be it's not the best way to live i wish i would have cut my foot to the floor i'd be at least a 50 millionaire or 100 millionaire now if i'd have just foot to the floor the whole time but again lesson for you comfort is a big killer of success and progress so i was comfortable as comfortable making hundreds of thousands doing nothing online in my 20s so i did nothing i was comfortable making good money in the nightclub uh in my 30s and being a nightclub owner and stuff I was doing stuff, but, I, you know, I wasn't focusing on the right stuff, probably. And, and I don't know, it just all went there. So anyway, so I was like, okay, I'm going to get rid of the nightclub. I closed the business. I later, years, a couple of years later, I, I, I tried to get permission on the nightclub as uh, for flats. Because during this period, I've become a property portfolio owner. I bought, I started buying properties. And I thought, I'll get permission to turn the nightclub into flats. I'll turn it into flats and I'll make money that way. Anyway, I decided that wasn't for me because I wasn't focused on it. I got to trust somebody else too much. So I got the permission after a long, drawn-out process and, and ended up didn't do it. I actually sold the nightclub to one of my later students uh, in the info product space out of a business I started later on. I sold the building to him and he got permission for flats in it. Um, and I don't know if he's developed them or he's developing them now. I don't know what he's doing, but he owns that property still. So one of my old students in an info product business, totally unrelated, ended up buying that property and turning it into flats and good on him. Like I'm, I'm proud of him for, for what he's achieving and what he's doing and good on him. So I got rid of the nightclub at this stage and my old internet business still making a bit of money, but I later shut it. I know people say, oh, you shouldn't shut things like that. I did, I shut it, I didn't sell it. It was still making in the tens of thousands, I think, when I shut it, I just shut it probably stupid looking back but I just wanted to draw a line under it and I and I, and I ended up um, going right okay I ain't making the money I'm, I was used to making uh, what do I do to make money again this nightclub done things done I've had the experience it was good it's over my old internet money's not dried up totally but it's not what it once was what do I do so I thought well I'm going to go back to this space that I hated the internet um, and come out of retirement, if you like. So I ended up looking at business models as of that time, ended up going down the Amazon rabbit hole, spent probably the next 10 years in that Amazon rabbit hole, but in that rabbit hole, 
And I don't want you to take the conclusion from this as, oh, Max made his money on Amazon or whatever. No, what I've done is I ended up going into the software as a service business, which is what we've been in the last seven years with my business partner, who I found she was a mentee. She was a student of mine. And uh, I made, that comes with its own stories, which are amazing. But uh, she, she became my business partner. We own a bunch of software companies together uh, that support Amazon sellers. We own a prep center uh, that supports Amazon sellers. So we've, we've got a little ecosystem of software suite and tools to help people do the online arbitrage business model on Amazon. So those businesses are still a thing. They're, they're a thing, uh, but they mostly run themselves. Holly, Holly runs them, plus Karen uh, runs them. And we've got a team that do, do a lot of that, that stuff. So it's like, my passion isn't Amazon. My passion isn't super duper software either. My passion info products, which brings me to today. I fast forwarded like a look at load of years there, but it brings me to today. Um, I invest in crypto. I invest in stocks and shares. I invest in property, although I fell out of UK property. I'm slowly getting rid. Um, I'm in the process of moving to Dubai. Uh, I've got a bunch of companies, UK companies. I've got a Dubai company, uh, and, I, and I'm and I'm back full circle, full circle here again. You, if anybody stuck with me almost two hours of my story, and again I appreciate you if you have, I really do. Full circle, I'm back. You imagine I've just spent the best part of two hours telling you my story of all the bits I've learned. Each one of those little bits of story where I might, I might have spent five, 10 minutes telling you about it probably represented years of my life and I've skipped years. I've been doing the info product game now. And again, I've skipped loads. There's loads I've skipped. Loads I've skipped. I've done launches, taught people how to make money and bought up a business model since in the last few years. And, and I've done launches and I've done webinars and I've done paid ads and I've done... Uh, I've exploded communities and I've made loads of money on tight little niche things and like the diversity of the diversity of information I've got locked in my head about the info product space, about the remote digital income space, about making money online um, is unreal. And it just feels crazy to take it to my grave. So, so it turns out one of my biggest passions is in business is the intangible. It's the non-physical products. It's having an idea. It's being, it's that boy, it's that boy that had nothing and was told he'd be nothing and had no guidance, no mentors, no direction, no clue what he was going to do. Having no resources, having no money, and being able to change his life. I think that I can't move away from the passion attached to that digital income, that, that transition that anybody can make from where you are now. If you're willing and able to teach others what you know, then you can go on to make an absolute fortune. Um, and if not, if you don't do what I did and take your foot off the gas, then a real fortune, not just a small fortune like I've made, like a real fortune, like like real fortune. Um, and I don't know any other vehicle that I would suggest people use to get there. Because like software, we do a lot of it. We've got our full-time devs. We've got companies that do software. We do good money in software. Um, I wouldn't say go into that space because it's like it's, it will eat you up alive if you don't have that skill set that experience it will probably eat you up alive it's not easy um, and then physical products you've got to order in from China China you've got to buy a load of stuff like that's like, I don't know if you think about it you can start an info product business now just deciding you're going to do info products. And it changed my life. But I've acquired all these skill set along the way. And this story. And each one of those bits, whether it's outsourcing to the Philippines or it's uh, outsourcing 
to Ukraine or Turkey and all the other places we outsource to and and managing teams and recruiting staff and I don't know, there's just I've got so much stuff in my head and I want to share it. And part of sharing that, the best way I can, involves me telling a story so people know that, okay, or Matt might not be Grant Cardone or Alex Hormozzi, but Matt's relatable. Matt has been where I was and uh, or am. And Matt's clearly got a depth of experience that rivals the big boys. That sounds really braggy and I'm trying, I'm trying not to be braggy. I'm trying to be humble. But I just, I've got a lot to offer in this space and I know how much it can change lives. Anyway, thanks for listening. That was the longest version of my story I've ever shared. If you got to this part of the story and you legitimately watched it, I mean, you skip to the end and let me say this bit. If you got to this part of the story, tell me that you're here to carry the carpets in the comments. Wow, two hours. Two hours just talking at a camera. Going off on tangents. But I even watch this myself. We'll see. Thanks for watching so much. Getting back into the content creating game. I know not many people are watching this stuff. Not many people are going to watch this stuff. And hopefully you got some value from it. But And hopefully you can help me. And yeah, anyway, I'm going to press stop because I'm rambling now, aren't I? But yeah, thanks for watching, guys. And I'll speak to you soon. Info products change my life and they can change your life. Speak soon, bye.